Let's go ahead and pray. Lord God, this Christian life that you call us into is so rich. It's so rich. That people could recognize how good you are. I, I can remember many years thinking of goodness as a rather milk toast adjective to describe you. And the older I get, the deeper that word becomes to me. Your goodness is overflowing and abundant and sweet and it fills us up on the inside when you fill us up. You don't just give us the things that we need, you so often give us things to enjoy. You could have made all foods taste exactly the same and we would have been equally nourished. And yet you, you give us food to, to light in, food that's an experience. Likewise, would you give us the warmth and beauty of Christian fellowship and the longer I'm in this body, and I suspect my brothers and sisters could testify the same, uh, the more I love um, the body of Christ because of the rich ways you pour out into my life through my brothers and sisters, and hopefully each of us have that opportunity to experience. Would you take our time this morning and use it for really good things in our lives? Would you... Glorify yourself this morning as we study in Jesus' name. Amen. I modified our, our beginning questions this morning. I've kind of been asking a general question that I thought might be helpful to give some more specific questions to help you think about the past weeks. So if you just read through the down through this first bullet there, those that, do we have anybody on the call yet, Peter? Say, say again? Do we have anybody on the call yet? Um, Don? No, there are three participants. Okay, good. So I'll read them for the benefit of those who are on the call. Is there any suffering you've intentionally embraced recently because you recognized an opportunity to be united to Christ in it? Share if you're able. Were you able to incarnate the gospel in your suffering? Were you able to rejoice in your J-curve? What did resurrection look like? Was it helpful to think about justification being your foundation as you suffered? So pick any of those. Can, can, can any of you say, you know what, yeah, I, I, I did go through something this week or in the past weeks. And the things that we've been talking about have impacted the way I'm thinking and behaving. This is maybe just a <clears throat> slight <laughs> suffering, not really planned on. Well, so yesterday we were at the store, <clears throat> me, Joe, and Shuko and I, and uh, there were a lot of people, and the line uh, was way back, uh, <clears throat> going around the, the aisles, etc. So I'm waiting on the long line, and somebody comes sneaking up through one of the other, the side aisles, like, with a big, huge grocery cart full of stuff, like, uh, is this a line here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was about ready to say, yeah, the back's over there, but I was like, go ahead. And um, I don't know, it was just kind of a little teeny bit of, well, hey, you know, just go for it. You know, for a lot of people, that wouldn't be a teeny thing. <laughs> really? Right? Yeah. Was there anybody behind you? Yes. <laughs> uh -oh. In protest? A lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nobody said anything, so. Oh, okay. Now, they're all Asian, too, so maybe they can speak English. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, for anybody else. Thank you, Paul. It's nice to have you in class, by the way. Get to kind of see your face again. Yeah. <laughs> anybody else? Any questions? Tyler? Uh, probably just like, you know, uh, I have three other siblings, and so just like, you know, sharing personal belongings. Um, I don't know if, if you remember, um, but like, when you're a kid, you like, you know, kind of claim your territory and your like personal belongings and stuff like that. And Ethan had my water bottle, and I was like, oh shoot, he has my water bottle. And I was like, you know what, that's a cool water bottle, I'm just going to let him use it, because, you know, he likes using it. So, was, so that's just a... Right Me? Yeah. yeah. From the big to the little, I mean, this runs the gamut, doesn't it? Anybody else? This is 
is not an answer uh, at all, but um, I find it interesting that you put on here, what did resurrection look like? Um, because that implies that we might see it within seven days. Um, and in reading uh, Genesis, or maybe I'm in Exodus, I don't know. It's my one-year Bible, so I can't always tell what book I'm in. Yeah. I don't pay attention. But anyway, um, Israel is get, getting out of Egypt. That'll be Exodus. And they've been there for 430 years. And that's an awful lot of people that didn't get to see any resurrection. That were just slaves, birth to death, no resurrection um, for them. Uh, like, the J curve was, like, really long for the nation of Israel there. So, um, just a comment. Sorry. Yeah. Interesting. I had a I had a discussion actually. Bob McKemmy walked in this morning and handed me a, a sheet and said, Matt, can you read this real quick and give me your feedback? And he was actually the whole paper was about trying to explain people's suffering and what we how we should and shouldn't respond. And we were having a brief chat about that. Yeah, interesting. Some of the suffering we go through really is that's a deep, long J curve. And you don't see the ultimate resurrection. But hopefully, even in those depths, there are many resurrections, what, which is what he talks about often, frequently throughout the book, talking about many resurrections, even when we're in those deep valleys. So, piggybacking on that, um, I know when I first started reading Paul Miller, it was this one actually, and he said, There is a resurrection. And I'm like, How do you know? Like, there's always a resurrection. And then I thought of Jonathan, who was a godly, wonderful man, did everything right, and I guess he got his resurrection to be God. And uh, I guess Uriah, you know, he was a good man, and uh, he also was going to rescue us because he got it. Yeah. 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 It's interesting um, to. One of the things that this book has been training me to do uh, has been to be looking for those little resurrections. Because I think oftentimes we're we're looking for that big resurrection, and it, it often doesn't come the way we hope or think it will. But we're looking for that little resurrection. For me, this week, uh, Friday a week ago, my family and I went skiing up at Blue Mountain. And I've been skiing my whole life, and so it's you know, something I always do in the wintertime. And um, it wasn't until, it was it Sunday? It was Sunday, and um, in fact, after I taught, and I went home and I started to get this pain in my lower back that was shooting down uh, my hamstrings and was very uncomfortable. Um, by Monday, I was in an absolute agony, just... I mean, pain going all the way down my calves, just, and the only position I could find to get comfort was standing or walking. Every time I sat down, every time I laid down, I was just in agony. I just couldn't hold still. I was rolling over and groaning and just in a lot of pain. And um, so the only thing I could do, like, I got about six hours of sleep over the course of three nights. <laughs> I was just awake, pacing back and forth in my house because I couldn't just downstairs, walking back and forth, just to try to get some comfort in my legs. And um, uh, went to Ryan Vermeesh, and uh, he helped me out a little bit. I ended up going to my family doctor and, and getting the script, and now I'm a lot better. But I was, I was, throughout that, I was thinking about J-Curve, and I was thinking about, um, uh, I'm getting to experience right here the edges of what Jesus experienced on the cross. I mean, that's where we see him experiencing the most physical pain and how he was responding to his Heavenly Father in that moment. And I was thinking, Lord, please, I want to suffer well. I don't want to become grumpy and sullen and um, and use this as a, a, a reason to just indulge in some, in some sin somewhere to, to just comfort eat, you know do that kind of thing. Um, and I was talking with Cindy afterward, and I said, you know, I think I think I'm learning 
um, how to how to walk through real physical pain in a godly way. And and uh, I, was, I was very conscious of what we've been studying here throughout the whole thing. That, that was that was neat. That was neat. There's a little resurrection. Let's go ahead and jump in. We're in chapter eight. Uh, I'm sorry, chapter 9, uh, but in chapter 8, we explored the ramifications of working through our J-curves without the foundation of justification by faith. This week, we'll consider the flip side, justification by faith, that stops short of the J-curve. And I'm gonna, we're going to immediately pick up where Pat uh, kind of started us last week, because he asked a hard question, and I was just fumbling around to try to find anything worth, worth saying. I was glad for Steve Boyer being in the room and a couple others. Um, Pat, you were wrestling with a paragraph on page 72, so we're going to go ahead and read that paragraph. And Pat, if you can remember what you were wrestling with, I'm, I'm hoping that, that we're going to see Paul Miller himself answering that question. So if you look at page 71, I think we're looking at kind of the second paragraph there, love dying, loving dying beggars. Loving dying beggars helped Mother Teresa know Christ more deeply. Her love deepened her faith. Love creates faith. But only as we enter into the dying of Christ does our faith grow. The field hockey bench, well, I think, and I think that's maybe the sentence you read, Pat. Yeah. Right. Can, can you remind us of what you were wrestling with last week about that? Well, if you, if you just take the statement by itself, love creates faith, yes. it seems to it seems to negate the idea that faith comes first, that's all. I, yeah. I only thought a different word than grace may have been more appropriate, that's all. Okay. But I understand what he's saying. Yeah. I believe what he's saying. Yeah. yeah. So let's go ahead and page over to, to uh, page 75. Too far here. Page 75. Can I have someone, someone please read the first two paragraphs of, of that chapter there? I guess I could do that. Thank you. 75, first two chapters. First two paragraphs? Yeah. Okay. Martin Luther, we discovered that God accepts us not because we are good by our love, but because Jesus is good by our faith. Neither are we justified by a mixture of faith and love. We are justified by faith alone. In thesis, 20, in thesis 28 of his Heidelberg Disputation, Luther summarized the priority and purity of faith. The love of God does not first discover, but creates what is pleasing to it. In other words, God doesn't find love in us, he creates love in us as we look in faith to Jesus. Faith is the energy for love. We can never begin with ourselves. Luther, Luther found it that found that deeply liberating. Here I felt that I was altogether born again and had even entered paradise itself through open gates. Does that deal with some of your discomfort from last week? Is yes. That said it to yes. I mean yeah. I still would probably use a different word. That's all. But okay. you know, I know what he's saying. Yeah, this is this is what he's saying for sure. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I, did, I wasn't sure we, we settled that last week, so I wanted to return to yeah, it. Thank you. Fine. Thank you. Several places throughout the chapter, Paul Miller connects the J-curve and sanctification. So let's look at page 76, first paragraph. Last sentence. Speaking of Martin, Martin Luther here. As he matured, Luther increasingly saw the danger of <clears throat> lawlessness. But he never consistently grounded sanctification in the J-curve with its dynamic of living in Christ. So he's connecting here. He, he, he's working with this idea. Paul Miller is working with this idea, and we've talked about it, of connecting the J-curve with the process of sanctification. Now, let's flip over to page 80. And we're going to read the whole paragraph in general since the Reformation. In general, since the Reformation, our vision of the J-curve has been weak. Most Christians are puzzled by the Apostle Paul's references to participating in the dying and rising of Christ. 
I grew up memorizing the great catechisms of our faith. Their overall pattern is God, creation, fall, redemption, law. When it comes to the Christian life, the teaching focuses on the Ten Commandments. That's good, but we have something better. What's missing is not an emphasis on sanctification, but the spine of sanctification. Dying and rising with Christ is the normal, the normal Christian life. The combination of some theologians' nervousness about imitating Jesus, combined with our nervousness about suffering, means we have a weak vision of the J-curve. Right. <clears throat> we find ourselves agreeing with Paul Miller uh, that the J-curve must be inseparably linked with the process of sanctification. Why or why not? We've talked about this a little bit. Is that starting to sink down from your from your head to your heart? It's something that you're embracing and saying yes and absolutely. Where are you all with that? It seems like even when it gets to your heart, it's still very hard to accomplish. It is, isn't it? Because our natures are really pushing back on suffering. Suffering is 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 something that our, our, certain our culture trains us to reject as normal. It's certainly something that we and our, you know, our bodies as we suffer and our minds as we suffer, we want to push it away. But it's one of those things that he's going to keep hammering on throughout the book, trying to bring us to the place where we're willing to embrace the concept of suffering as inextricably linked from the process of sanctification. You have to make it powerful. I realize I'm hopping in the middle because I came late, so you're, you're, you're fine. You're fine. Um, in my experience at our church, we don't often use the terminology union with Christ so much. What we do talk a lot about are those texts from James and Romans 5 about suffering, producing, perseverance. And that's exactly what this is. That's just a lot more on the practical side. But it's the Holy Spirit uniting us to Christ in his death and resurrection, which gives us the benefits of justification, and then we live that out. And that's what James says, count it joy, my brothers. So I, I want to suggest that maybe we think about this more than we do. We just put it in different terms, at least in my experience of how we talk about it here. I don't know if, that, if anyone else would agree with that or maybe push back on that. I'd be curious to know your thoughts. Yep. That, that passage, uh, uh, James uh, 1, 2, okay? These are all joy, my brothers. Um, when you suffer uh, the trials, and this trials mean persecutions. At what point do you begin, as a Christian, to begin to look at the um, on the J curve? The suffering becomes joy. Are we working in our sanctification towards that? So here, here's another persecution. Here's another trial. But now we don't see it as suffering. We see it as joy. Does anybody like that? <laughs> Are we working I, well, I think that's exactly what we're driving for. Right, I think that's okay. exactly what we're driving for is getting to that point where we can actually recognize it as joy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things that we're going to be okay, just a moment, Priscilla. I mean, one of the things that we're we're talking about. This is the very end of our chapter today when we're going to look at this diagram here, mm -hmm. where I have faith and I'm and I'm growing in love. Mm -hmm. And then maybe I'm going through a, a deep trial, and mm -hmm. as I walk by faith through that trial, mm -hmm. maybe I'm actually developing a deeper faith. Maybe there's something that's driving me deeper. My love is growing. My faith is growing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's where some of the joy can come from, is realizing Christ is actually being formed in me right here. Mm -hmm. I'm actually... His character is becoming my character. I'm becoming Christ-like, godly, holy. What deeper joy could there possibly be? Yeah, um, I guess we're done with talking, he said, in James, it's talking about persecution. Mm -hmm. Is that what you said? I, I think that the way it's, it's um, consider it joy, my brothers, when you face trials, and these trials meaning persecutions of one form or another. But they, it might be more in, maybe expanded to what we're talking about now. I, I have, I have offenses felt, or whatever else that you. Yeah, I have felt in thinking about this whole thing of the way we approach suffering, 
is that what the mistake that we make is that we don't call our experience suffering. We say, well, suffering happens in India, but I'm something else. And so we don't we don't tend to apply the scriptures about suffering to our lives because we say, well, suffering is, you know, if somebody puts me in jail for my faith or, you know, chops my head mm-hmm. off or something like that, that, you know, pain is not suffering because it's not persecution. So I think that we don't avail ourselves of mm-hmm. the scriptures that apply to suffering, and we don't avail ourselves of the sanctification because we don't think of it right. Mm-hmm. I am so glad you said that. Because I, I, I think there are a lot of things that we go through that we, I, I think you're 100% right. I, I think there are a lot of things that we go through that we don't put in the suffering category that we really should, biblically. Here's one we all, I, I, I would argue, and I'm in good company here because uh, David Pallison has written a marvelous, marvelous, I mean, it's a fantastic article. I wish I could remember the name of it at the moment. Where he, let, let me ask you a question. As Christians, what would you say your most poignant area of suffering is? Where do you suffer the most? What's your greatest source of suffering? Anybody want to stand up and say, my sin? We almost never put sin in the suffering category. Think about this. When you're, when you're going through... You, you sin. You've fallen in some way. You're ashamed. You're embarrassed. You're, you know, you're, you're very humble. And sometimes there are consequences that come along with that sin. And you don't put, you don't put the consequences for those for that sin in the category of suffering. Interesting. Oh, I wish I could. I, I need to try to look that up for next time. Um, if any of you, and some of you may be thinking, eh, I'm not sure I can go there. Because we tend to think of sin as something that's coming at us that we have no control over, whereas sin is something that's in me that's that's leading me in a direction I shouldn't go. By the way, Stephen Heidi, you guys should come on down. we got seats, a couple seats over here. Please come on down, please. Um, yeah, we don't tend to take sin... And put it in that category mm-hmm. of suffering. David Pallison makes a fantastic argument that we should we should probably be thinking that way. Think about think about that dual mm-hmm. nature. There's a war going on in here. The flesh, mm-hmm. spirit. There's a war going on in here. Yeah, yeah man. I, I'm, I really wrestled with with that those first couple of verses in James. Um, as it relates to my own life, uh, and, and specifically as it relates to having my daughter, Kira, right? When we found out that, that she had Down syndrome, um, it was like the carpet got yanked out from under me, right? And what I found is, you know, I, <clears throat> I went through a really, really powerful crisis of faith, personal. And I wrestled with sin in my supper, right? And so if, I I would submit that if I would have trusted God as it relates to my sin, then him getting me to to the place of being content with the fact that Kira has Down syndrome, would have happened so much sooner. Yeah. Right? Like, mm-hmm. so in many ways, it's my sin. You've been moving here. Uh-huh. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's, it's my sin of being angry with God. Uh-huh. Right? But it wasn't fair. It's like, okay. if I can if I can just rest in knowing. Can I get back to Suzanne? Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, you know, that it, it just, 
Yeah, I, Priscilla, I, I appreciate what you're saying about how, you know, suffering in many ways in our, in our culture, in our lives, we've lived very, very comfortable lives. Very, you know, being a missionary kid that has, you know, traveled around the world and I've seen, you know, like Priscilla, you're talking about, suffering happens somewhere else. You know, um, but yeah, I consider, you know, our country, you know, in the past two decades, and how many kids are, you know, committing suicide, and, you know, right under our noses. There's a lot of suffering all over the place, and right here. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Matt, um, Steve, <coughs> Steve sent a message that said uh, they were um, comfortable where they are. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Let's read the final sentence of that paragraph uh, once more. The combination of some theologians' nervousness about imitating Jesus, combined with our nervousness about suffering, means we have a weak vision of the J curve. Uh, why would some be nervous about imitating Christ? What's he getting at there, do you think? Because it means suffering. And who wants to suffer? To the mean suffering. Yeah. I think there's more here. Tyler? Uh, the historical part of this is that the medieval Roman Catholic Church got, with Mother Teresa as an example, got imitation of Christ very largely wrong with uh, meritorious you know, participation in his sufferings, that sort of a thing, mm-hmm. uh, which helps explain why Luther was so liberated from that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's really the idea is, is, is Christ here as my mediator, as my as the atonement? Or is he here because I'm supposed to follow his example? Well, if you put all your eggs in that basket, it's exactly what Tyler is saying there. Somehow, if I'm doing what Jesus is doing by suffering, I'm meriting heaven. There's something real upside down about that. And yet, if we let the pendulum swing all the way over to the other side, and we say we're not to imitate Christ... We're missing the J curve entirely. And there's something very rich here for us. So that's why we're camping out. Page 76. Paul Miller is discussing the missing component in Luther's life, the J curve. He does this by talking a bit about how Luther responded to Jewish people who refused to believe the gospel. He then compares Luther and the Apostle Paul. We'll read page 76, beginning with, in contrast, Luther's mentor through the top of the next page. Could I have somebody pick up there? Page, we're going backwards, sorry, page 76. In contrast, Luther's mentor, the Apostle Paul, did. Luther wanted to break the Jews, while Paul let his own heart break for them. I'm speaking, here's the scripture, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit but I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. That's Romans 9. <laughs> in this passage, Paul doesn't push suffering away by making Jews, the Jews his enemies. Instead, he laments, letting his heart break because they are his enemies. <clears throat> he receives the dying, his love for the, his love for the others. Even the hostile other is so great that he unbelievably vows he <clears throat> is willing to give up his eternal salvation for them. One more paragraph. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay. Paul, Paul inhabits the dying love of, love of Christ for his enemies so thoroughly, so completely, he would die for them. For eternity, Paul is willing to enter hell for his fellow Jews, his enemies. Luther condemns the Jews to death. Paul wants to be condemned to eternal death for the Jews. Substitutionary love. One aspect of the J curve is Paul's normal. <clears throat> Does the contrast that Paul Miller is making here between Luther and the Apostle Paul stand out in stark contrast to you the same way it does to Paul Miller? Do you look at that and say, wow? I say, which Jews? <laughs> because Paul 
really slam the Jews too. So I wasn't so sure. Unbelieving Jews. Unbelieving Jews, yeah. I mean, sure, I mean, you know, obviously he goes from town to town to town, and he's getting run out of town primarily by the Jewish people who are there, right? But, uh, Pat, it's worth mentioning, yeah. it's, it's the unbelieving Jews that Paul is saying, I wish that I could be cursed for their sake, for them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. yeah this is hard. Know. Yeah. This is hard. He's making a, but he's showing us a, a massive delta where, between where the Apostle Paul is and how he's thinking about unbelieving Jews and how Martin Luther's responding to them. I mean, think about the profound. He must. I, I don't know how many times I've read that. Many, many. That Romans nine passage. Haven't you ever read that and thought, "No way, man. No way." I I, I think of the wrestling match Paul must have had when he wrote that. When he wrote that letter, in that paragraph, is this really what I need? Can I really say I would be willing to? To go to hell if it would mean that my fellow Jewish brethren could could receive eternal life. You know, do I really mean that? Would I do that? I think of uh, this is what I was actually Todd when you were talking earlier about being in line at the grocery store and letting somebody with a big batch of groceries go in front of me. Like you compare that to what the Apostle Paul is talking about here. Wow. And yet, when, when we're in that moment, and because I know what I'd be thinking, I'd be thinking there's a bunch of people. It's one thing if I let somebody go in front of me. It's another thing if I let somebody go in front of the people who are behind me. Would I really do that for someone? Huh. And then you put that on a scale of, you know, magnitude to what Paul's talking about here. It's stunning. Uh, let me... Uh, I think that, yeah. you know, the problem with Luther is that <clears throat> he gets angry and frustrated and says, oh, this thing. Yeah. And then he comes up with just being anti Semitic. Yeah. Whereas Paul with this for his, he shows his deep love for his people. Yeah. Even though he's as frustrated as <laughs> Luther is. Yeah. It's a really different part of the equation. It is. Let's take that to 2021. How'd you vote? What would you do if you found out somebody in our congregation had voted differently for, than you? Pretty sure there are some who did. Right? That's why Pastor Steve has given us a book, you know, Jonathan Lehman's book, to, to work through. How are we thinking about people that don't, I mean, and the vitriolic, uh, constant barrage that, that you get on the news? How are we thinking about how are we thinking about whether you're on the everybody should mask up and stay six feet apart side or whether you're on the side of I can't I can't disconnect this mask I'm wearing from politics. And I'm upset with a particular political party because I think they're behind making me wear a mask and they should have no jurisdiction over me and and where it goes, how how I worship. They shouldn't be able to tell us what to do in the church. Whether you're on this side of the discussion or that side of the discussion, you're looking at other people who think differently than you. Wow. And that's not even, we're, we're not even talking about eternal life. We're talking about a stupid little piece of, 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 of cloth over our faces. Really? Would we let, would we let uh, a discussion about a mask separate us? Wow, tragedy. And those kind of situations are all over the place. Can you love somebody who embraces abortion? Can you love somebody who's had an abortion? All that kind of stuff that we hang on to and then we put between us. And you know, Paul's, Paul here is talking about the doctrine. And he's saying, I'm willing to lay my life down for these people. It's absolutely stunning. All right. 
What do you think he could be using? Uh, is it hyperbole? Hyperbole? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, there are different. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, you know, uh, I, I, I appreciate that because he does say, for I could wish yeah. that I myself were accursed and cut off. I could wish. I, I, I get the sense there, Paul struggling a little bit with, is this what I really think? I think you're right. All right, page 77. Now, can I Yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I, I feel like I need to put in a good word for my boy Luther here. Just Do that. <laughs> um, I struggle a little bit with this chapter because I think I mostly disagree with his historical claim for why Luther, I, I kind of agree with you, I think Luther was a sinner, had a bad temper, mm -hmm. more than he didn't understand the J-curve. Yeah. But I think you might read this chapter and think, I could read Luther and get a lot about justification by faith, but he's worthless for everything else. Luther talks on union with Christ a good deal and has a lot of good things to say about it. So don't not read Luther just because of this chapter. Maybe that's thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. And I thought he tried to he, he tiptoed, I think. Mm -hmm. he, he did tiptoe uh, you know in saying he didn't want to completely throw throw you Luther under the bus. Best. I appreciated that very much. Thank you. Uh, we're going to read the uh, last paragraph and study the graphic here on page 77. If we don't reenact Jesus' as dying and rising, then justification by faith can become a feel-good formula that gives us a positive self-image. The gospel turns in on itself and becomes one more thing to make us feel good about ourselves. Then individualism, it's up to me. Materialism, it's all about my money. And narcissism, it's all about me shape the core of life as suffering seems strange. Here's what that looks like. Interesting here, the, where it says, but it leads to individualism, materialism, and narcissism. Do you agree with that? Do you see how those two are connected? If, if, we're, if we're rejecting J-curve and saying that's really not a legitimate part of the process of Christian sanctification, if we're pushing that to the side, can you see how we become where it builds a good self-image and produces those things in us. Can you see that? And do you think that's a fair critique of current evangelicalism, where we are? Yeah? I guess my thought that's gone around in my mind is, like talk, Paul talks about fighting the good fight, you know, he fought the good fight. And I'm, I was thinking about Christ, you know, Christ J. curve, okay, uh, up until the point when his hour came, and the J-Care after that, seems like they were somehow different, you know. It's not like Christ just, just died, you know, constantly dying. And I just wonder if there's a risk, you know, in emphasizing this uh, J-Curve as well, that we think that we're not to also, you know, and lovingly engage, you know. That's all I'm thinking about, like the J-Curve for Jesus. You know, up until the hour when his hour has come, now he realizes this is God's will. He just, you know, he can go through the passion. But until then, you know, Christ is, you know, he's he's confrontive, you know, and he's he's same purpose. He wants to win people, but yet, you know, he's not just laying down his life either. I mean, in one sense, spiritually, he is because he loves people. So I don't know. That's just where I'm trying to sort that out. Let me make sure, I'm going to try to understand you before I answer. Okay. Are, are, are you saying that prior to Christ's passion, mm -hmm. he's not in a J, he's not in J-curve? He is in J-curve. He yes. certainly is. But it's a different sort of J-curve. Oh, yeah. That's all I'm saying. And Martin Luther, or not Martin Luther, but Paul, you know, I think that when he speaks about fighting a good fight, he's, you know, it's not just rolling over, you know. Because that's all I'm saying. So, and so how do you know the difference? Or the other thought comes, kind of, how do I know if I'm not coming down into a dungeon in this, the bottom of the J, or am I really, you know, in the will of God as I, I'm going through this struggle or conflict, whatever it is, you know. And like, you know, his trip to Florida, you know, he was at the bottom and he was really, felt like he was almost denying the faith. But yet, you know, God was at work and then he, he experiences a whole different joy. I think one of the moment. challenges. I think one of the challenges of what you're talking about is actually recognizing when I'm going into a J curve. Okay. At least it's been. Or am I going into a crash? 
<laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I think it really has to do with how we're viewing our suffering. That's why I keep coming back each week saying, how are we thinking? Are, are, is the way we're thinking changing? How am I viewing the leg pain I had this week? You know, and I was conscious of it. I was so glad to be conscious of it. Um, because God's going to use everything. He, he, he doesn't waste those Amen. times when we're in suffering. Yeah. Um, all right. We're going to see this graphic in living color. Uh, let's pick up page 79. Tom knew a little. Uh, can I have somebody read that paragraph, please? Tom knew a little of a love. I'm going to read it. Thank you, Suzanne. Tom knew a little of the love that takes someone else's place. He understood that Jesus died for him, but he didn't know how to die for his wife. He believed the gospel, but he didn't become like the gospel. Tom's grace-only lens harmonizes with the therapeutic vision of the fragile self, hunting for balance, security, and identity. Both the grace-only lens and the therapeutic lens reinforce people's self-absorption. Tom was self-absorbed. I want to kind of take this apart in pieces here. He believed the gospel, but he didn't become like the gospel. What would it have cost Tom to become like the gospel to his wife? He names it here in this little vignette. What would it have cost Tom to become like the gospel here. Sitting silent. Cover his wife's shame. Cover his wife's shame. Had he absorbed that shame himself, taken it on himself, be willing to embrace the pain he was experiencing, which was in this particular situation, shame. Embrace that shame. Shut your mouth, or rather, turn off your computer. I'm going to ask the question again. Again, how expensive that would that have been? What more would it have cost him? A little more shame. Bearing a little more shame to what he was already experiencing. What would it cost him? Tom's grace-only lens harmonized with the therapeutic vision of the fragile self, hunting for balance, security, and identity. I, I, I feel like that sentence by itself could could take a whole class, period. Um, how would you define the therapeutic vision? Uh, remember, we talked back in chapter one about the manager and the therapist when, when we were talking about uh, Paul's trip to Florida with his daughter. We talked about the manager, should have done this, this, and this. And the, the therapist, um, what does he mean here by this therapeutic vision? I was thinking that it says, I think the key word there is hunting for balance, because all those things are important, balance, security, and identity, but we have them all in, in another, you know, and so if we don't stay in that other, then we try to find it in our own identity, so I guess, am I saying that right? Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Try to be filled up on the inside, right? Therapeutic vision. How am I feeling? I'm ashamed. How can I get out of shame? I have to protect me. It's about me. It's this therapeutic vision. Um, what is the fragile self? That was an interesting term. Brittany, if I can get you talking any time today, I just want to hear your voice. <laughs> you too, Pat. <laughs> Pat, I call you Pat again, Valerie. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm Pat in here. <laughs> I did that when she came in this morning. I called her Pat. What is the thing we share with others, right? We always have to be on guard against anything that's threatening to ourselves or ego. And if something does threaten us, or it's effective when it's been treated. Or get back to delivery and just feeling good about ourselves. Um, and you see the colleges where they have quiet rooms and 
trigger, you know, you could say something that's a trigger that might affect somebody emotionally. It was before project, right? And you can't say those things before the first one. Um, I think it's just a mark of the time that people are being Yeah. We fall apart real easily, don't we? We come unglued real easily. There's not much of a foundation when that's happening. And I would say, I'm, I'm pointing at Matt Carter. <laughs> How little it takes to just get me to come unglued, not a whole lot. <laughs> not a whole lot. Yeah, I find that when when we're kind of high up on the failure process chart, that's when we have a very fragile self image. Yeah. You know, like the fragile self is there. Got to build me up, got to build me up, got to build me up. Mm -hmm. I refer you back to page 77, that graphic. I'm not going to take the time to go back there now because I think we have that. Page 79. Uh, Tom's vision of knowing was limited to Jesus' work for us in the atonement. This narrow vision eventually ended his ministry. Uh, what kind of character will be missing from a person who isn't consistently unified to Christ in his suffering? What kind of character will be missing from a person who isn't consistently unified to Christ in his suffering? I think the first per first thing that came to my mind was humility. Yeah. A humble heart is well, you see it in Jesus. You know. Ultimate humility. Yeah. I think you're spot on, and I think a very close cousin of humility is compassion. It's compassion. Because if we're not embracing this, if we don't recognize that this is this is our address, this is where we live in the J curve all the time. We're 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 in J curves. If we're not recognizing that, what we're kind of tend to do, and this gets to the next question, what kind of depth is missing in the ministry of a person who isn't consistently not unified with Christ and suffering? Um, boy, compassion is going to be missing there. What kind of counsel am I going to give you? If I'm not living here, I'm probably going to be saying things like, you should probably try doing life like I do it. Be like me. That's the kind of counselor I'm going to turn out being. Instead of walking with people in their suffering. Not to say that there's not counsel and advice that we give, because surely there is. Um, this is. This is deeper. Question. We'll get real practical here. Could you sit with someone who is uh, really struggling with homosexuality? Could you say to that person, I'm just like you? I'd say I'm similar. Sean? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'd probably say I'm just like you in the fact that I struggle with sin, but not in the fact that I struggle with homosexuality. I would, I'd probably say to that person, I'm just like you because I'm a sinner and I struggle, but I'm not homosexual. I don't struggle with your sin. I struggle with my sin. So, yeah, I would say I'm just like you, just not in that way. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's good. What I'm thinking, I, the way I would probably respond would, would be to say, um, I'm sexually broken. I'm sexually broken. You know, the way my heart and mind is wired is not for men, but for a lot of women. Right? That's where, that's where the Lord has to meet me in my sexual brokenness. Why can I say that and feel safe in this environment? Because hopefully you all are in... in, in probably similar J-curves in the way we struggle and the way we think and the things that we fight through, right? Um, in order to have that kind of compassion for other people, you gotta, you got to see yourself accurately and understand where you are locationally in that J-curve. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> Please tell me somebody else is here. <laughs> yeah. PG, the church tends to. Matt? Yeah. Hey, hey, it's Brooke. My, Hi, Brooke. my sister, they moved to LA to be, um, to start a church, and they deal with a lot of this homosexual stuff in their church, and a lot of people work for Disney, etc. So she had said one thing one day, it was so powerful, but so simple. The way they counsel their people is, God says no to a lot of things. He says no to gluttony. He says no to lust. He says no to selfishness. He says no to homosexuality. So it was a beautiful way to build a common ground with these people that he says no to things for me too. So it doesn't single you out. Right. So it was very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Brooke. Excellent. Okay, we're going to pick up on page uh, 80, the church tends to. We're at the top of the page. The church tends to oscillate between abusing grace, which is forgetting the law, and forgetting grace, legalism. Some emphasize believe more, and some emphasize be good, as Richard Gaffin observes. Too much of church history has gotten trapped in a false dilemma, the dilemma between atonement, Christ as mediator, in conformity, Christ as example. Christ's footsteps lead, as Paul tells us, into the fellowship of his sufferings and being conformed to his death, Philippians chapter 3. Uh, we, often, uh, we often do vacillate, don't we, between licentiousness and legalism. Beautiful what Gaffin does here. The answer doesn't lie in abusing grace or forgetting it but in becoming like the Savior who extended that grace in the first place. And I think, I, I think I'm going to go back to Pilate, your comment about, about imitating Christ. Is, is Jesus our atonement? Yes, and absolutely. Is he our example? And the reason we get uncomfortable with that is because we, you know, we're thinking, well, I'm going to self-flagellate. I'm going to beat myself so that I can be worthy of heaven. That's not at all. What he's, what he's going here. Now, we're not supposed to go out looking for suffering. But when suffering comes to us or from within us, um, embracing that and, and meeting Jesus there, your pain is actually where he wants to meet you. And when we're willing to do that, we begin taking on his character in new and deeper ways. We're we're, 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 we're moving here to deeper faith and deeper love, I would argue. Um, that, that, that quote from Gaffin, I didn't catch all of that. It really seemed like you read Page 80. Okay. I thought you added something to what he said. I was just reading the question here. Oh, okay. I just trying to find where you were. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Let's look at the graphics on page 181 and 82. Um, let's just read down through there and, and talk briefly about each one. Justification by faith without the J-curve. Jesus is distant. We just need him for salvation. And this is just insurance, fire insurance. Suffering feels strange, uh, avoids suffering. Wants to feel good to protect self. We'll go back to the, you know, that idea of the fragile self. It avoids dying. Pride unwittingly cultivated, which is why when, so Dave picked up on this immediately when we're asking what, what character is absent from a person who's not embracing J-curve. Well, here it is. Uh, pride. Doing what feels good. The J-curve without justification by faith. Jesus is distant. Dark night of the soul. So here's Mother Teresa. She's suffering, 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 suffering. And she's she doesn't feel God's presence. Uh, she's she's having a hard time standing on the promise of salvation. Hunts for suffering to find Jesus. Again, it becomes a meritorious work. Wants to experience suffering to get rid of self. Stuck at the bottom of the J, J curve. Pride and humility. What is that? What is pride and humility? We, we actually read this chapter uh, for devotions with family yesterday, and uh, I asked my daughter Brenda this question. She did pretty well with it. 
What do y'all think? What's pride and humility? Matt, once once again, I, I look at my my own life. <laughs> oh man, have I struggled with this? You know, um, just just as a uh, an example, um, we were attending another church, and and there was a mother who uh, her four year old, maybe five year old daughter, needed glasses. And she was lamenting the fact that, oh, my child now needs glasses, you know? Yeah. And what welled up inside of me was, really? That's all you got? You, you, your daughter doesn't have, you know, 47 chromosomes. Like, come on. What are you complaining about? So I can be arrogant in my own suffering. Isn't that something? Right, like, are we twisted? <laughs> are we twisted? You know, and so yeah. I have to, I have to constantly guard myself that somebody's trial, somebody's suffering, somebody who's dealing with something, um, it's not my position, it's not my right, it's not my job to determine whether that is an appropriate level of suffering or not. Because that J curve is for that person. Mm -hmm. However, from a human perspective, however big or deep or whatever it is, see, I, 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 I kind of have this picture that God sees each one of our J curves as kind of the same size. Like, He sees our sin as the same size. Like, it, the, the the effects of sin are are the same regardless regardless of what it is, right? Oh, maybe the the consequences are different, but the the you know kind of the impact it's all the same. Someone's soul, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. In many ways, that Jake heard, it, it's it's very similar, you know. Like, so it's not my job to determine whether your light pain matches all what I've dealt with. Yeah. Like, no. Yeah. So I I read that and I'm like, oh. Ouch. <laughs> Somebody pull it out. <laughs> Somebody pull it out. Absolutely. Let's flip over to the next page. We'll look at the final graph and then we'll be done. Um, essentially, so, you know, we're, we're looking here at, at Martin Luther, who he's arguing is, is, is pretty much here, faith and, and love for the Lord, and then Mother Teresa over here. Um, and really what, what Paul Miller is trying to get us to embrace is, is the entire is the entire graphic, right? Where he's saying we don't want to we don't want to be missing out on parts of uh, parts of this graphic. We really do need justification by faith as our foundation. We really do need to learn how to embrace suffering as the Apostle Paul is describing to us here in Romans. Um, and that's what we're trying to get to. We need to close. Uh, may I ask somebody else to pray this morning? Anybody else like to pray for us as we, as we close this morning? Father in heaven, we are very grateful for both of these elements of Christ's work, one on our behalf and one that we're united to him in. So thank you for sending your son to live a perfect life of obedience so that his righteousness is imputed to us and we are counted as righteous, our sins are forgiven, we are pardoned and adopted into your family. And thank you for uniting us to Christ by your spirit so that when we do suffer, when we do live as fallen people, as finite people, in a fallen and finite world, we can join with your Spirit's power to your Son to benefit from all of these things. We would be so hopeless without both of these things, and we thank you that we are united to Christ start to finish, and that it is your work in us. Help us to work it out as you work it in. Give us grace with each other. Give us grace with our families. Give us grace with our Matt mentioned political um, opponents, I might say. Give us grace as we worship in the next hour. 
Would your spirit be upon us mightily and manifest what is true of our union with Christ all the time, but would we see it more sweetly in the next hour? Thank you for Matt and his labors on our behalf. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.